Shall we play a game?
Hey guys. Am I awake out there or what? You guys awake? Are you waking up? That was like a cup of um That was like a cup of Starbucks on steroids. I'm telling you, that music was wild. Anyways, you guys all know me, I like the more calm music, more you know, spacey sounding music. Anyways, I'm hoping you uh, understand what's going on here. We're looking for Nibiru. We're looking at beautiful skies. That's part of the trip here. Um, you see the chemtrails there? They're laying the chemtrails. I always look for the chemtrails, you know. I see the chemtrails, I know something's up. So anyways, there is a bunch of sightings in this. Um, some of it's just beautiful skies. Um, sometimes you guys are going to find stuff I didn't even see. Um, you see all the flares, all the, all the lens flares. <clears throat> but there is some good shots in here. Be patient with it and uh, keep watching. Anyways, this is something I'm going to do with a lot of my footage. That's just beautiful skies. I'm going to add a bunch of clips in the same area with the beautiful sunsets, sunrises, noondays, and boat rides. Well watching. I'm going to do it all. Anyways, we're looking for signs in the sky tonight. It's about um, uh, 1130 Tuesday night. Sometimes I do my best work after the kids go to sleep and all the noise stops. I'm um, hoping this is recording good. I'll find out in a minute. I'm pretty sure it is. I'm hoping the music's loud enough. I'm hoping my voice is loud enough. Anyways, I've been having fun searching the bureau with you guys for a while now. And uh, it just gets more exciting, you know. See these fast pictures? That's a good indication. I didn't see nothing. So I sped it up, you know. I sped it up and so... Uh, there's a lot right there in the center. I'll give you some hints um, Towards the right, but mainly on these this these pictures right here is right in the center Then I have some other pictures showing up soon um, You know if you guys put it in the comments if you put the timestamp and all that's good right there in the middle Everybody's probably seen that one three times already, but these are different days if you look at this this day right here is 11 1 2015 see now this is Where's this cam at? This cam is in Italy. I believe it's in Italy. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, this is where I got all those shots that last week. And you'll see some of those shots, you know. This is Addicted to Sports uh, cams. I love the boats here. Check it out, check it out. So, you know, there is sightings on here. But this is what it's like when you're out here looking for... Nibiru, we go through these clips and we go, wow, look at the skies, ain't they awesome? Now you see that shadow to the left? I just seen a big shadow to the left, right there to the left. Right in the front to the left. Look at that, look at that orange. Now I know Nibiru's near. Look at that orange, come on, what? That's like, you know, that's, that's like orange. Look right there in the middle, guys. So I'm helping you right now cheat a little bit. I'm also waking you up, distracting you. Look at that, a little spot up in the sky. There's all kinds of stuff. Now, what I'm doing is just narrating, and I'm going to calm the music down a little bit. I don't want you to fall asleep. This is going to be one of the longest videos I ever did. Um, if you get this far, congratulations. You qualify as a Nibiru hunter. Most of my videos, according to demographics and uh, attention, the, you know, uh, audience attention span and all, look at that fireworks. Wow. Check it out. So anyways, uh, <clears throat> audience, you know, um, how long we keep somebody in a film. It's about three and a half minutes right now. For a while there, it was like two minutes. Um, before I started doing short videos, it was like two to five minutes. So what are you going to show? You got to show it quickly or you got to make it interesting enough to, for the people to stay. Keep watching, guys, as I'm talking. Um, I'm just rambling. You know, I'm doing what I do. Right there, boom. This one tracks. Um... And I've looked at these a number of times, and I know that one, the red, and then that white one on the left of it. I know those are two uh, shadows of planets going through. If I put infrared and I put chill the gamma rays out and do all the stuff everybody does, you'll see clearly that those are not lens arrays, you know? Look at that. Look at that. Simulator just exploded right there. Look at that orange to the kind of like a purplish color right there to the left. Yeah, it, there's all kinds of stuff in these skies. This is one of the best places. Italy is one of the best places to look right now. Um, like I was saying in my other video today, or yesterday, earlier, um, you know, I was seeing chemtrails in California. Like, 
I've never seen chemtrails before. It was amazing. Anyways, um, and right now, you know, in California, we're seeing tons of chemtrails all day long. Here you go, right there. Now, I know that's not a, a lens flare. I don't believe it is. Um, see the black spots up there by the sun. They see the colorful ones? See, the prism, the prism mechanism's really kicking in. They're really trying to put, like, 15 circles so you don't see the two or the one. Look at that green one. That's a lens flare reflecting probably that planet to the right right there, right now under the sun. See, it's crazy. You can almost tell what's behind the sun by what they're reflecting. And that's my view anyways. That's my opinion. Um, so anyways, I'm going to say goodnight here and rest, run the rest of this video out with some really good uh, Native American flute music. And I'm getting ready to put together one where I'm playing the flute myself. Uh, that's going to take a little bit of time, but... I want you guys to keep your eyes open. Watch the moon right now. Make sure it's our moon when you look at it. Because if it's full, take a picture of it. Get it to me. If you guys want to send me your pictures, it's um, Nibiru Watching 2017 at gmail.com. Okay, I'm getting ready to put up a Twitter just for the uh, community, the Nibiru community. I'm getting ready to put up a Facebook just for the Nibiru community that's you know that I see out here and what I'm gonna do on those is I'm gonna be tweeting out pictures just still frame pictures of some of my sightings and a lot of times they will be on the video so you'll get a clue beforehand what I'm looking at and that way you can kinda of be looking for my video if you see something really interesting you know watch for my video make sure you watch it and um, what I'm trying to do also guys for you to know is I'm trying to put together a community a community that will work together finding pictures I don't care if you send them to me Jeff P WSO um, the Bureau watcher I mean there's a ton of guys out there doing excellent excellent work I, you know much respect to all of them and a shout out to their websites they got some awesome teaching they go, they're doing and you know they're they're doing what they believe that they're seeing check out these guys guy oh my god it's unbelievable Anyways, they're doing what they believe they're seeing, and they're sharing it and trying to wake people up. Um, what are you getting woke up to? What are we getting woke up to? We're getting woke up to the fact that, you know, you could prep all you want, but how's your soul doing? Are you spiritually okay? Are you spiritually okay? You either are or you're not. And, um, you know, one of my viewers said, you know, what's with all the, you know, the Jesus talk and the brainwashing? Actually, I'm trying to get you guys blood washed by the blood of Jesus. And the purpose of doing this website is to show you signs and wonders in the sky, to be a watchman, to blow the trumpet. So your salvation is at hand right now. Decisions, decisions, the valley of decisions. Yeah, I, I can go on and on. I just wanted to do about 10 minutes of this. And so I'll give you eight. Anyways, um, make that decision. Ask Jesus into your heart. I believe that you died for me, Jesus. Come in my heart. Change my life. Save me from the wrath to come. It's that easy, guys. And I guarantee you that the presence of God will touch you, even as I'm talking right now. It's touching you. You're saying something's real. This guy's nuts. He's bold. He's brave. He's a preacher. He's religious. Uh, one thing I'm not is religious. You know, <clears throat> I have a relationship with Jesus. I know he's real. I've been healed of Parkinson's disease high blood pressure, hepatitis C, and recently a double broken back in 10 years with a 10-hour surgery. I could bend down and touch my knees. Glory to God, I've been healed. I know Jesus is real. It's not some occult thing. It's not some religious thing. It's real. Jesus is real. Right now, Father, I just ask that your son Jesus touch everybody by his spirit in Jesus' name right now out there in the bureau. Now, I just ask that you put the peace of God on them and give them a good night's rest. Give them an experience with you and the angels. In Jesus' name. Alright guys. We call it propaganda or brainwashing. I call it blood washing. So I'll leave you with that. I want you to see you blood washed by the blood of Jesus. Keep watching. Keep your eyes up. And watch the rest of this video. And God bless. Have a good night. Bye bye.
chapter 12. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out in the pain of labor as she awaited her delivery. Suddenly, I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his head. His tail dragged down one-third of the stars, which he threw to the earth. He stood before the woman as she was about to give birth to her child, ready to devour the baby as soon as it was born. She gave birth to a boy who was to rule all nations with an iron rod. And the child was snatched away from the dragon and was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to give her care for 1260 days. Then there was war in heaven. Michael and the angels under his command fought the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle and was forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has happened at last! The salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ! For the accuser has been thrown down to earth, the one who accused our brothers and sisters before our God day and night. And they have defeated him because of the blood of the Lamb, and because of their testimony, and they were not afraid to die. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens, rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, and he knows that he has little time. And when the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the child. She was given two wings like those of a great eagle. This allowed her to fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be cared for and protected from the dragon for a time, times, and half a time. Then the dragon tried to drown the woman with a flood of water that flowed from its mouth. But the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. Then the dragon became angry at the woman, and he declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments, and confess that they belong to Jesus. Then he stood, waiting on the shore of the sea. Chapter 8 When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar, and a great quantity of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people, to be offered on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of the saints ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth, and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blasts. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down upon the earth, and one-third of the earth was set on fire. One-third of the trees were burned, and all the grass was burned. Then the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea and one-third of the water in the sea became blood, one-third of all things living in the sea died, and one-third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. Then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great flaming star fell out of the sky, burning like a torch. It fell upon one-third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. The name of the star was Bitterness. It made one-third of the water bitter, Many people died because the water was so bitter. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, and they became dark. And one-third of the day was dark, and one-third of the night also. Then I looked up, and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, Terror! Terror! 
honor, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. Chapter 9 Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. When he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace, and the sunlight and air were darkened by the smoke. Then locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to hurt the grass or plants or trees, but to attack all the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with agony like the pain of scorpion stings. In those days people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee away. The locusts looked like horses armed for battle. They had gold crowns on their heads, and they had human faces. Their hair was long like the hair of a woman, and their teeth were like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron, and their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions with power to torture people. This power was given to them for five months. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek, Apollyon, the destroyer. The first terror is past, but look, two more terrors are coming. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice spoke to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. And the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one-third of all the people on earth. They led an army of 200 million mounted troops. I heard an announcement of how many there were. And in my vision I saw the horses and the riders sitting on them. The riders wore armor that was fiery red and sky blue and yellow. The horses' heads were like the heads of lions, and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. One-third of all the people on earth were killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses. Their power was in their mouths, but also in their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to turn from their evil deeds. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or their immorality or their thefts.
Shut up and sit down. How blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. When you know, when you really know the sovereignty of God and His Lordship over all things, 
seen and unseen. When you're able to confess him as the supreme ruler over all things and to confess that he is your Lord and you are his possession, then at that point, you are the happiest of people. You could not get any happier. Nothing could happen that could be so wonderful that it could possibly be better than the happiness you have in the Lordship and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. When you know that you are situated, that you are located in the heart of the happiest, most powerful person ever to live, then you cannot be more happy than at that point. When you're able to step back into his rest and live in the high tower of his name, so that when the enemy comes raging against you, he cannot find you. That's joy. That's happiness. How blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, the one who made heaven and earth, who made the sea and all that is in them, the one who keeps faith forever. When all your confidence is in the one who made heaven and earth, when everything you need in life is utterly dependent on the goodness, the mercy, the kindness, the love, the grace, the power of the one person who is supreme God above all gods. When your present and your future and your health and your destiny and your life depends totally on the God who works for weak, twisted, and deceitful people, then you simply have to be the happiest people on the face of the earth. Because your happiness is built totally on the knowledge that the God who gives favor to weak, selfish people he has given you an unshakable conviction and confidence in his ability to bring change and power to bear on your life. Therefore, the most wonderful thing that you will ever do with your life is to trust it to the nature of God. To put it into the hands of a God who totally loves you and is deeply committed to you and delights in helping you. It is the most happiest feeling to totally trust the best, the most honorable, the most powerful, the most integrous, committed, and faithful covenant maker who is also the most decent person who ever lived. Jesus. Being completely reliant on his character and integrity is the source of your great happiness. We rest in your nature. For me, Father, you are the kindest person I have ever known. You're the happiest person I know. You're the most consistent person we have ever dealt with. You never change. Everything comes down to us from this Father of lights. 
in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You say with absolute confidence, I am the Lord. I change not. I am the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And beloved, we are learning to live in the paradox of God. To know that He is consistent, but He's also unpredictable. He's consistent in His nature. You always know where you are with God. You seldom know what He's going to do next. But you always know where you are with God. Because he never changes. When Moses said, God, please show me your glory. Maybe he was expecting some great light and display of power. And God just looked at him and smiled and said, Okay then, I'll cause all my goodness to pass before you. Because the glory of God is the nature of God. That God is good. He's good. He's good. He's unfailingly good. He's good. He's good. God is good. He's good. He's good. And He never changes. He'll always be good. Yesterday he was good, today is good, tomorrow he will be good. And it's your destiny to have the goodness of God pass before you. You'll never change. You always know where you are with him. He never changes. He is consistent, the most consistent person ever who will never change his heart towards you, no matter what you do. He cannot be anything other than what he is. He's a covenant maker and a covenant keeper. And he's good. Our God is consistent. But he's also unpredictable. You never know what God's going to do next. You always know what he's going to be like. You never know what He's going to do next. And that God has called you to see the invisible and do the impossible. God has not called you to do the things that you can do. He's called you to do the things that you'll never be able to do in a million years. You're not able to do what God has called you to do. Only He can do it. But He's called you to live in His faithfulness. He's called you to live in His consistency. That He will come and do all the things that need to be done. So beloved, you cannot find security in what God is doing. Because God commits you to the impossible. He asks you to see the invisible. He calls you to do the outrageous. There is no security in that place. There is no security in what God is doing. There is only security in who God is. This great God that we serve will throw us into situations beyond us with no other thought than that His great heart will sustain us. And the answer of God to everything. Every excuse you want to make why you cannot do something. The answer is always the same. When you look into his face and you see the twinkle in his eye and the grin on his face and he looks at you and he says, nevertheless, I will be with you. That's all, that's his only answer to human weakness. It's okay. I'll be there. 
He is the great God who sends us out as lambs amongst wolves. Why? Because the lion is padding by our side. See, what God has called us to is outrageous, impossible, and totally unpredictable. And the only way that we will do it is because we are secure in the nature of God. He is consistent, but He is unpredictable. But the church, you know, is the opposite. We are inconsistent in relationships, but oh, so boringly predictable in everything that we do. That's the nature of the change that is coming, beloved. And the only way that we will come into that high place of anointing and power to seize the moment, to advance the kingdom, to swim against the tide, to go against the odds, to sail against the wind that's in the world, is if you and I are resting in the consistent nature of God. That you and I have a testimony of what God is really like living in our hearts in such a powerful way that it drives everything. It's that testimony that is the very essence of prophecy. The testimony of what Jesus is really, really like. I'm the Lord. I never, ever change. I'll always be exactly like this. And we are discovering what the exactly like this is really all about. Beloved, do not be distracted from your journey into the nature of God. Don't be distracted. Because that's the source. It's the wellspring of all your joy, all your peace, your rest, your revelation, your anointing, your power. It's the nature of God. And when you learn how to rest in the nature of God, when He comes walking within the impossible, you'll be the one that gets out of the boat to join Him. You won't be one of those who are standing there wondering or thinking about joining Him. There will be this instinctive, intuitive need to put your leg over the side of the boat and start walking on a substance you have no business being on except that he is drawing you there it's your destiny beloved it's your destiny to walk in the nature of God and do greater things than he did it's your destiny but you'll never get out there unless you learn how to live in here. You're perfect. Beloved, you're perfect for God. You're perfect. And He's going to make you perfect in His nature. Stamping the image of Jesus on you. It's going to be great. And that's what the desert is about. It's about discovering the majesty of God. Hosea 2, 14, 15 says, I will captivate her heart and draw her into the wilderness to speak kindly to her. And out of that place of coming into a revelation of the nature of God for me, out of that place, God will give you your vineyard of fruitfulness. It's guaranteed, eh? See, He knows the plan He has for you. 
the things he wants you to accomplish. But first, first, I want you to see me as I really, really am for you. As I am for you. As I am for you. I want you to know me as I am for you. Now, every one of us needs a revelation of an aspect of the nature of God. For me, it's always been the kindness of God. God has been relentlessly kind to me over many, many, many years. Kinder than I deserve. Relentlessly kind. He has pursued me with kindness to a point where every living day I expect to have an experience of the kindness of God. I have an expectation when I wake up in the morning. Even in my dreams, I expect the kindness of God to come. I can't remember a day when I was disappointed in the last, I don't know, 10 years at least. Thing is, I look for the kindness of God every day. Because that's my joy. It's to see the hand of kindness coming towards me. The kind word. The blessing. Even on the difficult days. There is always an act of kindness for me. Because that's my revelation. He's the kindest person I've ever met in my entire life. Beloved, he will not rest himself until you have a revelation of what he is really, really like. Then he has to back that revelation up with experience. These are the things he so loves to do. He is faithful. From this day on, for you, there is no such thing as a good day or a bad day. There is only a day of grace. And some days the grace of God...